Hello, hello, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the next iteration of the Professional Advancement Workshop Series, or PAUSE. Today, we are going to be talking about applying to postdoc positions. After grad school, it kind of feels like the next step is to continue on that academic training path, and the next step would be postdoc. But moving between grad school to a postdoc is not always easy, and it's not always clear how you go about doing that. And we hope to help you out with your journey through academia and beyond as uh, through this panel today. So let me introduce myself. My name is Jessica Noviello, she, her, and I run PAWS. I'm the, ne ugh, I'm the Nexus NASA Postdoctoral Management Program Fellow, and I am based at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So today we have a larger panel than we typically have, but it's because there are so many different types of postdocs, and I want you to hear from as many people as possible who have recent experience being postdocs and applying to postdocs of all different flavors. So uh, let's go over a couple of, because we're trying a new format today. We'll, we'll see how it goes. We're going to do an hour of the panel, and then we're going to transition to an unrecorded peer-to-peer -peer discussion section. I mentioned in the email yesterday that this is um, this is going to be potentially, what's the word here? I don't want to say a rough conversation, but for me, when I was applying to postdocs, it it chipped away a lot at self-confidence. And it it's really easy to to feel like, oh, I guess I'm not quite enough for this role or for this job and it's really easy to talk yourself out of a job so we're going to come into today's discussion with an open mind and supportive spirits because we're all here to learn from each other and we are all here to to make sure that we are okay making it to the next step and also okay walking out of here with our our self-esteem intact so uh, without further ado, I am going to transition to yielding the floor to our panelists, and they're all fantastic. I'm really super glad that they could all make it here today. Without further ado, let's begin with um, Francesco. You were the first one in the room, so would you go first? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, very happy to be here today to talk to you guys. Happy to share what I know. Uh, I am a new civil servant in uh, planetary science at NASA Goddard, but uh, I'm very recent. I started in January. Before that, I was doing what I call the postdoc dance. So I actually did three different postdocs in four years, um, one of which was international. So um, happy to answer any questions and hope I can be uh, of help to you guys. Oh, and I should say uh, planetary science for me is actually very recent. I was primarily a terrestrial seismologist. Thank you, Francesco. Um, Alicia, you're up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Johnson. I'm an isotope geochemist. Um, I got my PhD in 2020. My first postdoc was an NSF ear postdoc fellowship that was at the University of Chicago. Um, mostly there, I was using transition metals and their isotopes to learn about magmatic processes like crust formation. And since then, or since August of last year, I've been at the University of Arizona in another postdoc position here. I'm partially grant funded, and I'm also helping with the laser cron facility here. So I'd be happy to talk about what those positions are like and kind of like um, filling in gaps between fellowship funded postdocs and other types of postdocs that where you kind of create the position yourself. Thank you for being here. Amber, would you like to go next? Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Young, pronouns she, her. I am a recently graduated uh, PhD student from Northern uh, Arizona University. And uh, my transition on to the next phase of my career is a little bit different. Technically, it's a postdoc phase, but I'm in the Pathways program. So I started off as an, uh, an intern during my graduate phase of my career. And once I graduated and I had uh, completed all of the requirements for the Pathways degree program, then I was uh, just recently hired as a civil servant to continue on with my work at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. So have that, that being said, and having been only in this role for a couple of weeks now, because I just defended my PhD in July, 
um, I can sort of give anybody some insights on what you can do if you are still a graduate student and want to sort of prepare the next phase of your career uh, via the Pathways program, if that's something that you might be interested in. And I can, you know, talk about that more later. But um, my research interests are mainly uh, involving, you know, exoplanet science and astrobiology and studying uh, biosignatures, how we might be able to uh, detect detect them with future telescopes. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Oops, I hit the wrong button. It's a pleasure to have you, Amber. Um, next up, Kara. Hi, everybody. I'm Kara Brugman. Uh, this is January. I started a new position as a research scientist here at Arizona State University. I'm an experimental petrologist, and I got my PhD in 2020, just I think a week after Alicia did. And I was a postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie Institution for Sciences Earth and Planets Laboratory, formerly known as Geophysical Laboratory. So this was a position where I um, proposed a project of my own and then was basically hired based on the strength of that project. And then it transitioned into something else that was not what I proposed at all, which I think is pretty common. Um, so I'm happy to talk about the fellowship process. Thank you so much. And then last but absolutely not least, Nick Wogan. Hello. Uh, yeah, Nick Wogan here. I um, just finished my PhD at the University of Washington in the Earth and Space Sciences Department. And um, there I I worked on like photochemistry and climate models of the early earth and um, also some stuff in relation to biosignatures and the origin of life and um and i just tomorrow i start a postdoc at a nasa postdoctoral program at nasa ames um and i'm going to be working on sort of photochemistry and climate modeling of exoplanets and some jwst targets as well as some um sort of preparing for future telescopes as well um and uh yeah that's me um yeah so i don't know if you heard but every single one of these panelists they have a different background so alicia did an nsf postdoc and we have the npp program represented in both nick and myself amber is pathways Francesco and Cara do postdocs and Cara was um, in Washington and has now set up a lab and is in the process of setting up a, a lab still. Yes, <laughs> okay. And um, Francesco was international. So we have a whole range of perspectives here and I hope you ask lots of questions to take advantage of all of their collective knowledge. So I'm looking at the poll for those of you who have responded so far, and it looks like 82% of you are looking to apply to a postdoc this fall. So I'm going to close that poll and I'm going to open up a second poll to just ask you the question. Uh, if you go back into Slido, you'll see that now there is a word cloud of option available. And the question is, how do you feel when you think of applying to a postdoc position? Anxious was the first one to come in, and it has multiple votes. Uh, overwhelmed, fear, nervous. Overwhelmed's got two votes, too. Okay, so um, I'm sensing a bit of a lot of, of a negative kind of emotion about maybe there just feels like there's so much to do, and, and how do you know what's right? And oh, okay, guys, don't. Okay, team, do not worry. We're going to help. Please ask questions. We are going to ask as many questions or we're going to answer as many questions as possible and then stick around for the discussion period afterwards and we can help each other. All right. Francesco says that postdocs are fun, no need to worry usually. Oh, okay. Francesco, would you like to expand on that? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I can kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and I think uh, just just uh, because sort of everyone else was sort of saying where where they did their education and postdocs, um, I got my PhD in New Zealand at Victoria University of Wellington in 2018. And the three postdocs that I ended up doing were the US Geological Survey, 
an NPP at NASA Marshall and then at Caltech. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I found that a lot of my PhD was just spent developing skills and um, at least sort of maybe I got particularly lucky with the way sort of my postdocs worked out in terms of who I was working with. But I kind of had really clear leeway to kind of do whatever I wanted, provided that I sort of found the right funding that made sense for, for myself and uh, for the position. And um, I found it to be a lot less stressful um, than, than, a, than, than my graduate studies personally. Um, cause I, I just felt like I could kind of do almost whatever I wanted and not sort of almost waste any time. I like hearing you say that you are, um, or that you found your postdoc to be less stressful. And, and I have to say, I felt the same way. Um, other, other panelists, would you like to speak up? How, how are your postdocs or how have they been so far? So I'll just chime in being kind of like the odd man out where since Pathways started when I was already in graduate school, that meant that I was able to get connected with the research team that I was working with, which were folks um, in, in SEEK and in the Code 693 Planetary Sciences Division. So it allowed me to meet people early and make those connections early on and, you know, jump starting into the research aspect of it. Fit, I was finishing up my PhD when I started uh, Pathways. I only had like one more semester left. So that part of it definitely felt a little bit more hectic because I felt like I was finishing up my dissertation, but also trying to meet folks and get connected. And it felt like another job <laughs> that I was responsible for and doing. But I will say that Pathways took a lot of burden off of my shoulders because the job search was streamlined into, okay, I know that this is going to be my pathway forward to a permanent position. And while it's never, you know, guaranteed uh, and how the transition will, will work, but um, I do definitely feel a lot less stressed now than, than I was, you know, doing classes and doing research, you know, it kind of makes room for focusing on what you want to do, which, you know, if that's research or mentoring, you know, I feel like you have more freedom after, <laughs> afterward uh, to really build on that. Can I hop in? I, I agree um, a lot with what both of you are saying. Like, um, so I got the NSF ear postdoc fellowship right after I graduated and immediately the sense of freedom of, um, I had an advisor, but the money was mine. So I got to choose how to spend it and when to spend it, what conferences I went to. And if I had an idea of expanding my project in a certain direction, I just got to do it. And that was amazing. And now I'm in a different postdoc where I don't have that freedom and I miss it so badly. So it's, if you can ever be in charge of like your own project and have complete control over like all the research decisions made, it's also very confidence building to say, look at me, I'm doing the whole project myself. Of course, you have an advisor who's like training wheels if you need help, but um, it makes me that much more proud of like any papers I publish or anything I produce from that work because I know it was all me the whole time. So I, I liked it infinitely more than being a grad student for that, even though it's scary and um, all, all of your stress is like real and I understand it, but it's uh, a lot to look forward to. I would definitely never want to move backwards. I like where I am now. Yes, Francesco. Um, just to kind of build up on something, because uh, Alicia just brought up a really interesting point that I really didn't have much experience with before um, before starting uh, my postdocs, is all the differences. You're going to need to become experts on all the difference about the various types of funding. And you're kind of obscured from that during your PhD. I mean, I certainly was. Um, even though I was getting sort of outside funding, it was sort of still a little bit different. Um, and you're going to need to be really, really careful about what the fine print is for the various institutions. Um, so, uh, because it's just going to be things that unless you've been through that situation or you know somebody that has been, 
your, 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 your mind is never going to go there because you just don't have that experience. So for example, this happens to me twice. One of them was um, because my first postdoc was with the US Geological Survey, but half of it was in New Zealand when I was doing my PhD and then uh, back in California. And uh, due to the grants, I actually was getting paid by the same, sort of through the same channels, both for the duration of the postdocs, meaning that I was living in California, getting paid in New Zealand dollars, um, which was really, really rough. And I had no idea that that was a thing and nobody just thought to tell, tell me. And uh, so that's like one. And the second thing is if you win a grant, um, you may not actually have the ability to have it be yours depending on what institution you go to. So I won a grant, uh, I won the, um, a grant through um, NASA, the LDAP. And that was when I was at NASA Marshall. And by the time that I got that grant and I won it, I knew that I was going to Caltech. And they said, no problem, we'll just bring it over to Caltech. Unfortunately, um, I, Caltech has rules, for example, I can't be PI on a grant. So I had to select, and, and I kid you not, this is true. I had to select a professor that I was working with at Caltech who had nothing to do with the grant. They had to be the one, they, we basically had to redo the grant through NASA to make them PI, even though they didn't have anything to do with it. And then I had to pay them because they have additional rules about you have to pay the PI. And what's more is when I left Caltech, there was still money in that grant and I couldn't take it with me because it belonged to Caltech now. Um, each university is different, each institution is different. So be really, really careful and start paying attention in terms of all the different, what's the difference between sort of a regular grant and a cooperative agreement and all that stuff. That's gonna be things that um, you're gonna need to know that I at least had zero experience with during my PhD. Yes, uh, there's definitely a huge difference between being on a fellowship and being paid through something like a grant like like Francesca was just talking about. When I was a postdoc at Arizona State, I could be a PI, but now that I'm on a fellowship, the rules are very complicated. I have to be like affiliated with a local university. I can't even propose like I'm at NASA because I'm I'm technically not at NASA. So as you are applying, just be aware of, of all of the different rules that are around. All right, I'm gonna transition over to the questions because we're starting to get a lot coming in. And the top question right now is, how did you balance applying for postdocs and finishing your dissertation at the same time? This is, this is a really stressful time period and I'm glad we're going to be talking about some ways to make it more manageable. All right, Nick, Nick, you can, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I appreciate how polite you all are. So um, I guess I'll just say what I did um, for time management. Um, I didn't do any of my thesis when I applied for postdocs. I, I was very lucky and I could basically put things on hold for about a month. And I spent about 100% of my time. Um, not to say that you need to do that, um, but um, yeah, I sort of just, I just put things on hold and, um, and yeah, that was, that was my approach. My approach was that I started looking for a postdoc really early. So I, I knew I was going to be finishing in spring 2020. So I started kind of putting out feelers the summer before that. So I had emailed people and um, tried to meet up with them at conferences that August, I think it was. I think that's when Goldschmidt Barcelona was. Um, and then when GSA was in Phoenix, I met with a lot of people there too. Um, so it was a sort of like a double process of first cold emailing some people who I hadn't really met before, but I knew of. And then also emailing people who I'd kind of kept track of over years, like, oh, I think that that person would be cool to work with, or they work at some place like Carnegie that I think would be a really great place to be a postdoc. Um, then tried to set up with meetings, meetings with them so that when, by the time it was, it was time to actually write proposals, in some cases, some people were willing to kind of look over the proposal before I submitted it or look over parts of the application. 
they couldn't make a lot of direct comments, but they could kind of suggest like, hey, maybe you should mention a little more about timeline here, that kind of stuff. Um, so I would suggest kind of like applying to grad school to try to cultivate connections as early as possible to take some of the pressure off the back end when those due dates are coming up. I definitely um, kind of put all my thesis on hold for like that fall before I graduated. Like the summer was really productive um, in part because ASU requires a tech review where you meet with your committee and make sure that like you're on track to graduate in your um, expected timeline. Um, but I spent a lot of the fall, I went to three different conferences. I was at, um, or like four, four different conferences. I did Goldschmidt and GSA was in Phoenix. So I just went there. I think I did AGU or maybe not. And then I did like a Gordon research conference. And I would just casually bring up to like everyone I had met the previous five years, like I'm graduating. Do you know of people with money? And, um, sometimes more pointed questions to be like, it would be cool to work with you if you had funding because um, everyone across the board was enthusiastic about the idea like, oh, someone wants to work with me. That's great. It's like always positively received, but they almost never have like money or the timing isn't right and stuff. So I took the approach where it like doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and doing that at conferences is a lot less intimidating than just sending cold emails to people. It feels less formal and less like a commitment um, and then of all those conversations I had, I pursued three earnestly where I like wrote a proposal and was applying for money. Um, and then of those one, I heard back from right away. And it was nice that I hadn't pursued so many options seriously, because once you get one funded, you have to kind of turn down the others. And that's maybe a point where people can get sore feelings of like, oh, I was excited for you to come here and now you're going somewhere else. So I wouldn't spend like all your time applying to everything you see. Maybe just pick like the ones you're most excited about, put a lot of time into those, and then also make sure your thesis is on track. And I'll just um, chime in since Pathways is a little bit different. So um, the application process is uh, very much like applying to a job. You uh, do it through a website that's run through the government. Uh, it's USA Jobs. And all you need for the application is essentially uh, your resume with all the applicable background, your major and, um, you know, references and things like that. And then you have like a, a questionnaire that's a number of questions long, just sort of evaluating you on what would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? So the application process itself is kind of streamlined. And I feel like because the only way to market myself was through my resume, I spent a lot of time trying to hone that and put my best foot forward through the application process, um, which was difficult too, because, um, you know, it took several application cycles for me to even be considered for a position. Like the first couple of times my application was deemed ineligible for reasons that it's like it shouldn't have been filtered out, but it was. And then you can't go back in time and resubmit it or redo it. So I just kind of had to wait around until another opportunity to apply came about, which was definitely sort of the hardest bump to get through. Um, but yeah, the proper the preparation in itself is a little bit different since it's not about making a full scale proposal or proposing a project or anything like that. It's just kind of like NASA is gathering applications and they may be for, you know, an area of astronomy, but you're not necessarily gated toward which subfield you're in either. They're gathering anybody that has a major relevant to the job position. Uh, and so that's that's always nice in terms of like, okay, if the job opening is out and they want an astronomy person, I fit that, the qualifications are there, you know, and as long as you have enough time left in your degree program to do the 640 hours of work that's required to be completed before you graduate and before you're eligible to convert, um, then that's kind of like the criteria that they're looking for to first order in terms of whether or not you're, you're a match.
Nick or Francesco, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I could add a little bit on that. Um, I think, it, you know, it, it, everyone seems to be having like a different way to kind of go about this. And so um, my my way was actually drastically more different than because I, I did not expect to get into planetary science at all. And my first postdoc was basically really straightforward. It basically started before I even got my PhD unofficially, just because the New Zealand system is a little bit weird. Um, but for when I went to NASA Marshall, you know, as a doing planetary stuff, planetary seismology, like I hadn't really planned for any of that. Um, and so I think what's really important is also that um, the good news is that uh, as a graduating PhD, you actually know more than you think you know. And, and you know, you're just used to, especially when you're writing your thesis, you're just used to seeing problems and limitations. And, you know, you go to conferences and you might see other people and say, oh, they're clearly smarter than me or whatever. The reality is, you know, you, you, you're, you probably know a lot of things. And so for me, um, I've always sort of chased interesting problems. And the switch that I made, and postdocs really actually do allow you to do that. They kind of help you switch from whatever you were doing before to something, you know, tangentially related usually, but there, there can be some variation. So for me, I did, you know, my PhD in ambient seismic noise seismology. So I was imaging subsurface of geothermal fields and volcanoes and finding all sorts of things. And that was my first postdoc as well. But then I got really into uh, machine learning, um, just sort of on the side. And, you know, I thought of a cool idea and applications for planetary stuff. And that's how I got my way into NASA, right? That's so, um, you know, you can use a lot of things that you learned in your PhD to kind of help orient you or kind of shoot for something different. You know, let's say you really didn't like what you worked in your PhD. It's totally fine. Like you can use this as something to, you know, alter your career trajectory a little bit. Um, at least I did. Nick, you don't, you don't have to, um, no, it's fine. I, I was a bit confused if we were still on the same question um, about how do you balance or did we move on to something else? No, I, I think we've been wandering a bit in our okay. in our discussion, but yeah, we are still on the same question. I can ask a new one now, though. Oh. Um, so the, so did I answer the wrong question? I apologize about that. No, no, no. I think I think all of you had very important things to say, and it's it's kind of a, a it's a heavy load to lift to write your dissertation and to apply for jobs at the same time. There's there's no way around it. And I think something that I heard echoed in a lot of answers was relying on a network of people to to help you job search, but also to help with um, with reviewing the application that you're putting into. So for me, those are those are two takeaways. I don't know. Am I Am I summarizing correctly, team? All right, I got a thumbs up from Alicia. I'm doing good. Yeah, uh, I can't I can't emphasize enough how important it is whenever you're submitting a proposal, a grant proposal, a research proposal, anything, to get lots of other people to look at it, as many other people as are willing, um, especially someone who's already been successful at the same thing that you're proposing. So the next question up builds on this idea of, of proposing and um, so in PhDs, you're often given a project or, or you get help making one uh, for postdocs. It feels like you might have to come up with the idea on your own. This person is asking for any tips from brainstorming or, or just, just saying that building an independent research project can be really daunting. So tips for stress management there, just, just how do you come up with an idea for a postdoc? I can jump in first. Um, I My postdoc, my first one that I wrote the proposal for, um, was a pretty big pivot from what I had been doing before. Um, ideally, you want to propose something pretty close to what you've done before because it'll be easier to write it. It'll be easier to come up with the idea and that you already are a little bit of a, aware of the literature. And it's also so many well-qualified people are applying to these things, that if it comes down to who is the best prepared to execute their research, 
that if you can be the best person for your project that you're proposing, that is a competitive edge if you were comparing two identical proposals otherwise. And so um, I picked a project to write about that was kind of the natural next question to a paper I had just published. So I got to argue this angle where I was like, I am the best person to do this because look, I just did something similar and I'm the only person doing this thing. And I said I would go to the lab where they were the first people to make these measurements and therefore it was the obvious choice to go and just try to, um, aside from the, the question itself, I just tried to align all these things so it was like the strongest possible. And so I wouldn't stress yourself out um, coming up with something totally brand new that's totally out of your wheelhouse. Sometimes it's as easy as just saying, you know, and people will ask this at your defense too, like, what's next? Like, or what's the natural next question from your research? What would you do next if you could keep going with this? And maybe it's like that, but incorporating a new skill. So you still get to pivot a little bit in your postdoc, but um, use your strengths that you've been building this whole time. Sometimes it's um, what I tell students here is like, if you pick up a science or a nature paper, something really flashy, um, those papers have tons of assumptions built into them because there's um, only one way you get flashy science. It's like totally out there. It's almost a house of cards sometimes. <laughs> and if you pick one of those assumptions and say, I can test that, I can build a short proposal saying, I'm going to test this major assumption that you know this big idea is built on. It helps put your work in like an important context, but is something small and manageable for like a postdoc sized project that you could do in two years. Yeah. Um, in my case, so yeah, I wrote a NASA postdoctoral program proposal um, and I applied to a bunch of postdocs, got rejected from a lot of them, talk about that later, but um, the one that got funded, uh, it was an idea that sort of been, I don't know, I've sort of thought about it and obsessed about it over like over grad school and it just like, you know, turned into um, an application. Um, but I think at the same time, like it was definitely came from my mentors and like, you know, nothing comes from a vacuum, you know, things come from your peers and your mentors and stuff like that. And I, I was, I'm really fortunate. I have a ton of really good mentors and like, I feel like it doesn't have to, you know, your postdoc proposal doesn't have to be completely your idea, you know, it can be, you know, work with your, the mentors that you like and your advisors and, and stuff like that. And, um, like, I don't know, I think that it, there's no rule that it has to be like your own thing exactly, because that just never works, you know, working with a lot of different people, um, or whoever you work best with, I think, that's what was helpful for me, um, bouncing ideas off people. I'll say that when I was coming up with my exoplanets related project to propose, um, I came up with it completely independently. And after the fact found out that it was basically identical to a failed grant proposal my PhD advisor had written like the year before. Um, so even if you're <laughs> It's, I mean, there's not a ton of truly original ideas that no one has ever thought of before. So I wouldn't worry too much about trying to come up with something completely new. Um, I can just jump in and say on that. Like, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to come up with a truly original idea in terms of, because it's so much of what we do in our science. It's so based on, you know, the shoulders of giants and so these sorts of things. So we're already predispositioned to thinking up particular ways. Um, what I will have to say is, um, for sure, um, the more you kind of go outside of your comfort zone and the more you kind of try to incorporate different things, um, it might spark some originality. So for me, for example, how I got into NASA again was uh, I was just doing an online uh, machine learning class in my spare time. And I was just looking at some of the algorithms we were developing on that. And like, maybe some of this can be used for seismology. And so I started playing around with that. and um, just kind of stumble across something cool. So give yourself also the uh, opportunities to explore, I would say. Um, uh, that That's sort of my two cents, but I know my path is a little bit more unusual. Um, 
Okay, I think we can move on to an, another question then, because uh, yeah, it's we have so many to get through. Cool. Um, how many postdocs do folks typically apply for? And if you feel comfortable sharing, how many positions were you selected for versus how many rejections? Um, I'm going to insert right here to say when I defended, I, I did the wrong thing and I started looking for postdocs far too late. So when I defended my PhD in June, 2019, I did not have a job lined up. So if you are worried about rejection um, or, or just not having a job lined up, I don't want you to, to worry too much because things, things work out. The, I, I got lucky that I relied on the strength of my network to, to help me secure, no joke, a six month postdoc just to, just to help me figure out what the next step was. But that six months, because I had an advisor who introduced me to more people and helped me network even more, led to the position that I now have today. So so I want to tell you all that I know from experience, it feels really daunting and really scary to not know what comes next, but it will be okay, no matter what happens. Can I jump in? I um, wanted to add something about how different postdoc positions have different timelines for when you apply to them. So we're talking about proposals that take several months to review and several months before that to write. Um, so starting the summer before, if you're graduating in the spring, is a great idea to start talking to people if you're going to write a proposal for a fellowship or a project. But all the time, you can go to like the AGU Career Center right now, and they're advertising postdoc ads where people have money right now. Ideally, they would like you to start tomorrow if you could, right? So applying to those early is almost frustrating for everyone involved because they have the money now and they would like to hire you immediately. And so if you write proposals and they don't get funded, it's okay. Because there are like job ads that will come up later that you don't even know about, but they'll appear later. And then you can apply to them and say, oh, great, I'm actually graduating in a month and the timing is perfect. Um, my second postdoc, I went online and NSF shows all the um, grants that are currently funded for like, I was looking at the early career NSF grants and my current PI had just gotten one funded to do um, the types of measurements that I was doing all the time at that time. So I emailed him and I was like, hey, I uh, my fellowship is ending soon. I'm looking for another position. Um, do you have any availability in your group? And he said, what a coincidence. I just had this grant funded and I would love to hire someone immediately. So that could be one strategy too, is just seeing where grants are going and if those lab groups are still looking for people. Um, obviously as at a postdoc level, you're going to be much easier to train than a grad student. So don't forget that you are desirable and people would be excited about you. It's often just that they lack the funds sometimes. So if you go to someone who already has funding, you don't need to apply to 10 different jobs. You just need one person who has funding and is excited about you. And so Writing proposals is exciting because you get to have control over the project, but there are many options that happen later, much closer to your graduation date, and it's anxiety producing to wait for those opportunities to pop up, but they're always there. I've watched for several years now. There's always new job ads, always at not the timing that you expect, but I emailed my current PI in March and I was working in Arizona like four months later. So um, yeah, I think... There's a whole range of like starting a year in advance to starting one month before, depending on um, where the money is coming from. I mean, I can actually build on that as well. So, I mean, I think speaking for myself, and I don't know if the other panelists were like this, but I found you typically got rejected more than you got offers. Um, you know, not the degree of rejected or, or not, you know, it depends. Um, a lot of times it's not even really up to you. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, you get in that they say that they're wanting something, but you get there in the interview and they want something else completely different. I remember I applied for a postdoc uh, at a place that's going to remain lame, nameless. And, you know, they they basically said, you know, we're looking for somebody, you know, your skill set and doing this. 
And when I got to the interview, the project and things was something completely different. Um, and so it's really hard, especially if you're, because I mean, I applied to quite a lot of things because like other panelists were saying, there's just really staggered, right? So you apply for something, you're not gonna know for several months. And so you kind of need to start applying for other places as well, which can put you in an awkward situation where you don't really, you, you have to say no or yes to somebody before you know the outcome of all your other applications. But um, I think what's really helpful in these things is to really know what you want to do. And there's gonna be things you apply for that you're really excited about, some things that you're you know, not very excited about, but you're just trying to get experience with this sort of thing or some stuff that you're only moderately excited about. And that's something that you're gonna to need to figure out for yourself. And if you have a clear sense of, of what you like to do and how you wanna spend your time, I think a lot of these questions are gonna be um, a little bit easier and you're gonna kind of know what to prioritize and what to spend your time on and how to handle rejections. Before we move on, I just want to check in with all our panelists. Are we are we ready to move on? Okay, cool. Um, this is a very closely related question. Do you think it's better to apply to more than one postdoc in the hopes that one will work out, or should do you think that it's a good idea to focus on one postdoc application? I mean, it depends. Is the one like kind of a sure thing where you're already talking to the PI and they're like, yeah, I want to hire you. This is just a, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Like we're just going, going through the official motions to make it happen. If you don't have something that's certain, then I would not put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, the fellowships. Um they have very similar applications. Well, sort of similar. And you can sort of just recast your application to many different fellowships. So it's not that much effort to apply to five compared to applying for one. It is annoying. There are you know formatting stuff you'll have to deal with, but that's easy compared to the ideas. I'm going to ask a question that isn't on the the list, but I think it's very important and relevant to applications. But that is the question of of letters of reference. So, could you share how you decided who would be your letters of reference in your applications, and any strategies or or, or thoughts to consider there? I think um, at the end of grad school, it was actually maybe the most challenging time to ask for letters compared to now. Now I've worked with more people. I can say, oh, which one of my many postdoc advisors would I ask for a letter? But at that time, you know, you have one PhD advisor. Ideally, they would be a letter writer. Um, if you worked with someone in undergrad, it's probably a little far removed for them to speak to your current expertise and ability. And so asking other faculty um, on your committee, maybe, or having someone outside your university who knows your work well, maybe a collaborator that you've published with. Um, and you can just ask, like, would you be willing to write me a letter? And maybe sometimes they say, sorry, I don't feel like I know you well enough or something like if we've only talked at conferences. But generally, when I've asked people outside my university who um, were co-authors on a project, even if it wasn't published yet. It was enough that they've seen my work and my commitment to the project. And that was enough for them to feel like they could write a letter for me. And I've heard, I guess, from other people that that can be strong if not all your letters are from the same place. So um, it can be scary asking people for sure, but it's um, probably to your benefit to just ask many different people if they'd be willing to write you a letter. I was in kind of an awkward situation when I was applying for uh, postdocs because um, I hadn't really collaborated with anyone during my PhD somehow. So I, I had kind of worked with other people within my own lab group, but um, I hadn't worked with anybody 
co-authored anything with somebody outside of my institution or outside of my lab group. Um, but luckily I had been emailing quite a bit with someone who had um, published some other papers that were relevant to the first paper I published. And when I was working on that, I was asking him questions about his process and just basically checking, like, am I doing something completely insane here? Is my process okay? And he ended up being my external letter writer. He was happy to write it, um, especially when I was like, I, you know, I'm I'm sorry that I'm asking you this and it's kind of out of nowhere. We've only met each other in person once. We've never written anything together, but um, I think you're the best person outside of ASU who's actually familiar with how I how I think about things um, and the types of questions that I ask. So I, I think even if you don't have a lot of external collaborators, um, then there's there's ways to find people who are familiar with your thought processes who could write you a pretty good letter. I'll say if you TA'd for anybody, you can ask one of those professors to write you a letter to, especially if the position that you are applying to is more of a, a teaching position. There are some of those um, more so than a research position. Okay, it looks like we might have exhausted that question. Um, all good, let's move on. Oh no, we're running out. Why are we always running out of time in these panels? Um, there are a few questions that touch on the same kind of theme of transitioning from, from being a grad student to being a postdoc. One of them specifically mentions postdoc pay and how that, <laughs> how that transition is from being paid like a grad student to not being paid quite as much as, as a post postdoc colleague, but also just the mental transition of, of what is that like and what should we be aware of? Um, who wants to kickstart that discussion? I love it. great. I got paid so much more as a postdoc than I did as a grad student at ASU. I don't know whether that's more reflection on, well, Arizona, like Phoenix area, it's, there's a very low cost of living here. So the grad student stipend is pretty low comparably. And Washington, D.C. is a really expensive area to live in. So, I mean, ultimately, it wasn't that much of a pay hike. But on paper, when I saw that first paycheck, I was like, oh, my God, I'm rich. I don't know if other people had that same experience. Well, I mean, it kind of depends where you live, right? So, you know, I, I when I was in Huntsville, Alabama, like, it was amazing. I felt like I was living like a king. And then I moved to California, Los Angeles, and you're like, oh, Oh, uh, so I think in general, I, I think, I mean, it depends on sort of what, what your lifestyle is during your grad school, but my suggestion is, you know, don't overinflate your lifestyle because maybe the second postdoc that you do is in somewhere much more expensive, like what happened to me. <laughs> and then you, you're, you know, you're going to need to uh, um, readjust. I will say what's nice about the Pathways program is that they just follow the standardized governmental pay scales, uh, the GS level pay scales. So it's easy to look up what you're supposed to be making at your particular GS level, and you just kind of have to correlate where you're at with your graduate degree to what GS level would be applicable to you. So for example, post qualifying exams, I had qualified for the GS level 11 pay scale when I applied to the Pathways program, but there's levels below that too. So if you're pre-candidacy, pre, uh, I'm pretty sure that's uh, associated with like GS level nine and uh, below. So you can kind of figure out and predict like what range am I going to be in based on where I'm at in my level of education and then um, go from there. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted by my cat. Uh, thank you all for your for your answers. Uh, does anybody want to talk about that mental shift from grad student to postdoc? Because, um, and I can start this by saying I found that transition actually really difficult. Um, I came from a, a grad student program that had a very vibrant and active 
social group where we leaned on each other quite a bit and, and I had good friends. And then I started as a postdoc at the same institution and it felt like I was very isolated from that environment. I didn't get the emails anymore and I didn't know about things unless somebody remembered to tell me. And I had an office at the end of the hallway where nobody ever came to see me. And it was, it, it felt really lonely actually being a postdoc for a while. And at this point I have transitioned to a new job, a new position, and I do have, have people around me, but um, it, depending on where you are, that transition can be really isolating and lonely. So I'm hoping that by building up communities like PAWS, we can we can help each other with that. I, I don't know if, if that was the experience of anyone else. It was for sure the experience. Yeah, like um, Kara and I graduated in 2020. So we started our new postdoc, so we're not allowed to see anyone. And so that made making friends like basically impossible. I only talked to my lab group um, when I was allowed to like be in the same room as them. And yeah, so my whole first postdoc was at the University of Chicago and I talked to almost no one in that department, which feels really weird. And it's not what the experience is supposed to be. Um, so when I came to University of Arizona last year, I'm almost aggressively friendly, just appearing in people's doorways to be like, do you wanna get coffee? <laughs> like, Do you wanna be friends? Um, I invite people to trivia all the time. The answer is usually no, but it just like been very, it's, I'm getting more practice to just putting myself out there and be like, I don't even care. I know you're probably busy, but we need to like try to make friends with each other or we're all going to feel this way of like just being super isolated and never meeting anyone. And so I wish there was more. I like the idea that pause is helping build this network because otherwise it's all on you. And um Keeping your friends also from grad school and staying in touch with them, very helpful. Okay, cool beans. Are we um are we good on on that topic then? All right. I, I hope for those in the audience, I hope that these answers have been helpful. Um, one question here is, or actually there are a couple of questions asking about positions outside of academia and research. Now, I, I think by default, just by the fact that we're all here and still in academia, we, we might not have firsthand experience with that. But does anybody know of, of someone who maybe applied for a position not in academia right out of grad school? Yeah, um, someone in my, like, grad school family um she started working for industry right out of grad school and I think she really really enjoys it so <laughs> I, I I will say though I had some conversations with her when I was like oh do I want to stay in academia or maybe I want to try industry too and she said that the one thing that she really missed was that um in industry people just tend to treat it much more you know, for better or for worse, like a nine to five, but there isn't as much passion or excitement about what you're doing and trying to get someone who's like really interested in coming up with new ideas. She said that was much more difficult. She was used to being, well, she had, she had gone to like MIT. So she was used to like a very high level of discourse in the, in the department. Um, and that was not what she found the place where she ended up working. So if that's something you're thinking about, but you think you would miss that kind of collaboration and excitement, then maybe industry isn't quite the best place. Um, one of the other things is that that's actually a question you're going to need to ask yourself at multiple points, right? You know, it's not even just at the beginning of your PhD, but the, hmm, should I stay in academia or in research or should I go and do some, another thing. And um, industry's going to be calling in general, or you're going to be exposed to people working in industry. And so um, I think it's, again, you know, I think repeat what I said before is a lot of it is sort of knowing what you want, what yourself um, before starting this position at NASA, I had a, a, a job opening that, that I was, uh, I was going to be working in an industry in Boston. And so it was between NASA and, and this other gig and I chose sort of NASA, but um you know, that's something that, you know, I know some people that, for example, in, in seismology, like a very 
um, uh, trendy thing to do nowadays is actually go and work for insurance companies. And you'd think that wouldn't be very exciting, but it's, it's actually very, very cool. Like I have friends that absolutely love it and they get to spend, you know, overnight, they, they say they spent more time doing research there than they did, you know, during their postdocs um, because you don't have to worry as much about grants. Again, very position dependent and all these sorts of things. But, um, you know, I think it's important to say, you know, just, just because it seems like everyone on the panel has chosen the academia path and, you know, especially a couple of years in, you know, there, there are, there, there can be some fantastic opportunities um, out there in industry. So always just like, listen, always try to talk to people, get a sense of particular companies, um, everything, you know, I worked on two, just because the organization's the same doesn't necessarily mean that each team's going to be the same. My experience working at NASA Marshall, completely different than my experience working in the team at Goddard. So always just keep your ears open and just see what, what you think is cool. I like that answer. I um I keep industry in mind all the time. At the end of my PhD, I, I felt like I didn't end with a lot of hard skills. And so that was something I really wanted to get out of my first postdoc. I was like, we sat down at the instrument that we used to get our data. And I told myself, I'm going to learn this thing. I'm going to sit, I can sit down and run this by myself because I knew that that was something I, I didn't hate doing and that that would be really marketable if I ever want to pivot to industry in the future. And so that's what I'm keeping an eye on right now is like um, national labs have a lot of mass spectrometers like the ones we use. And it's like still research, but different research. They get paid so well there. <laughs> so I'm always thinking about it, always like, hmm, do I want to go make money? Maybe. And um, but, you know, choosing a postdoc doesn't have to say you're committing to one path or the other. It's just like giving you more time to build more skills and then even better decide what you want to do and what's the best fit. I think Alicia brings up a really good point there. Like this probably isn't the best example since I defended in like April, 2020, but by the time I finished my PhD, I was just like done with science. I couldn't, it didn't seem important at all anymore. And it really took the time of being in a postdoc to like kind of come back around like, okay, this is not this is completely different than being a student um, and just kind of give myself a chance to fall back in love with it because that stress of finding a job, writing your dissertation, defending, moving, that's, it's a lot. And I think it's unrealistic to expect yourself to know exactly what you want when you're under that much stress. Um, so I wanted to say that. And also I wanted to say that there are jobs out there that are kind of in between academia and industry. So for example, there's a company called Jacobs that subcontracts with NASA. And I know a couple of people who work for Jacobs at Johnson Space Center. So they're basically hired to do experiments, experimental petrology experiments for the civil servants that work at JSC. So there's different, there's like different steps between the two. Oh dear, we are at the top of the hour. So unfortunately we are gonna have to stop answering questions now. Um, although there is somebody who said, how do you find postdocs? There's no central list of fellowships. Um, no, there are job boards and I'm actually compiling a document and I'm gonna send it out to all of you as soon as it's done. So uh, just, just give me a couple more days and I promise you will get it. So, uh, I hope that this panel has been really helpful for everybody in the audience. Don't forget to stay on for our peer-to-peer -peer discussion. But first, let's thank the panelists for all of their time and their perspectives today. So thank you, all of you, for being here. You're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. And, uh, and I have to say thank you also to the NASA Astrobiology Program for their support of PAWS, particularly Sean Domigo-Goldman, Melissa Kirvin-Brooks, and Mary Wojtek. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, panelists, you're welcome to stay, but no obligation and just thank you for your time. This was wonderful.